So that was my religion in my childhood. Uh, I should say, though, to my mother's credit, she would do puja twice a day privately in her own house, um, morning and evening, religiously, without fail. And at the time, I didn't think much of it, but uh, now I really appreciate that. She did it very sincerely, she with devotion. Um, then in high school, I, was, I had a kind of philosophical bent as a budding philosopher. And in college, I actually majored in English literature and minored in philosophy. And I was also, I started being a kind of spiritual seeker and I started reading around in the world's religious scriptures. Um, Bible, parts of the Quran, Dhammapada, Bhagavad Gita. In Hinduism, I read Bhagavad Gita and I was really impressed. Um, and especially, I, I wasn't, I was agnostic at the time. And so I didn't care for the bhakti elements, the devotional stuff. But I love the idea of attaining a transcendental peace through renunciation and the Vedantic side, which is <clears throat> that we suffer because we mistakenly identify with the body mind. And through renunciation, we can realize our true eternal spiritual nature, our divine nature. So they, those things all impressed me. And I started developing this idea that I want to be a monk. And I still hadn't read a single word of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings or the teaching of Swami Vivekananda. I'd never met any Swamis or nuns. Except, interestingly, this is a bit of a side note, but when I was six months old, I was born in 1980, uh, my parents took me to the Boston Vedanta Society. At the time, the head was Sarvagatanandaji. And the tradition was among Boston, the Bengali community, that they would bring their babies for Annaprasan to the Boston Vedanta Society, even though they were not necessarily devotees. My parents were not devotees, for instance, but they brought me anyway. And the uncle is supposed to feed the baby, but my uncle was in England, so there's no question of him feeding me. So my dad was about to feed me, and Sarvagana said, let me feed your son. So actually, that was my first and only contact in my childhood with a Ramakrishna Mission Swami, but supposedly he was very saintly, so he may have put the bug in my head, who knows. Uh, but fast forwarding back to college. So I'm seeking, I'm reading the scriptures. Uh, then in, during my PhD, I read Swami Vivekananda's Raja Yoga. That was the first, my first taste of Swamiji, and I loved Raja Yoga. Uh, it was so powerful, so rational. Uh, he was trying to prove that religion is a science just as much as the natural sciences, that it can be experientially verified in the way that chemistry and biology and mathematics can be. So that impressed me. And then also the our tradition's emphasis on the harmony of religions, because I was faced with this difficulty there are all these different religions. Which one should I expect? Which which one should I accept? If I accept one, I naturally should reject the others. But after studying the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda, I realized that that was a mistaken assumption. So that was also very powerful for me. Um, and then right after my PhD, I was staying with my parents in Southern California, who were living there at the time, and I bought a one-way ticket to India. And I had been warning my parents for a few years that I'd be go off to India and be a monk, but they didn't believe me. And then finally, I showed them my one-way ticket. <laughs> and then they said, oh, this guy's serious. And then I thought, uh, before going to India, let me pay my respects to this very senior Swami at the Vedanta Society of Southern California in Hollywood, Swahanamzi. So... I went there, I attended the Arati, I believe, and then afterward, I went to his room, I did pranams, and he asked me about my background. And I said, very briefly in a couple of minutes that I just finished my PhD at Berkeley, blah, blah, blah. I want to be a monk in India. And then he looked at me and he said, I will give you Diksha. And I was a, a naive and ignorant young boy then. I didn't realize what a blessing it would be to receive initiation from him. So I was like, I don't know, Maharaj. I didn't even call him Maharaj. I didn't know that you call monks Maharaj at the time. But anyway, I said, I was planning on getting initiated in Bilumat, my idea. And then he said, see, in India, Diksha is a group affair. You get initiation in batches of 50 or 100. Here it'll be one-on-one. -on -one. So he's trying to sell it. <laughs> but I still wasn't convinced. 
So I said, let me think about it. <laughs> so I went back home. And then like one or two days later, I was on the phone with my uncle, who's a spiritual aspirant in his own right. He's a follower of Sri Aurobindo. So I told him this. And he's like, are you crazy? There's a senior monk who's a disciple of Vigyan Analogy. And he's offering to give you Diksha and you're hesitating. And he said, your birthday's coming up. Ask him to give you initiation on your birthday. I said, that's not a bad idea. So then I contacted Swamiji. I said, okay, I'll take Diksha. As if it's a great, I'm doing him a favor. You know? yeah. so, so then, and then I said, you know, my birthday's coming up. Would you be able to give me Diksha on my birthday? He said, yeah, sure. So, <laughs> so he agreed. And then the other funny thing, I'm supposed to, I'm Indian. So if you're a Westerner, he's not going to tell you to wear a dhoti on the day of initiation, but I'm Indian. So he said, wear a dhoti on the day of initiation. I've never worn a dhoti in my life. I didn't own a dhoti. So I told my dad, the only dhoti he owns is the dhoti he wore to my sister's wedding, which is this like bling bling, sort of uh, like a king's dhoti, gold. It's literally gold. It's a gold dhoti with like a, Embroidery. So I got a dhoti. And I didn't know better. So I, on, on the day of initiation, I come in in this ridiculous golden dhoti, <laughs> sparkling and shiny. And Swami just looks at me and laughs. We're in the Guru Dakshina, the fruits, you know. So anyway, I got initiation. I, was, I felt very really blessed after that. And then there's another curveball that he suddenly threw at me. So now he's, he's my guru. And I already showed him my one-way ticket. I'm, I'm, I want to be a monk in India. Nonetheless, he looks at me and he says, well, listen, uh, I know you're thinking now India is the best place for you as a monk and this and that, but you were raised here. I think he had in mind Deepak Maharaj and Hari. So anyway, he's like, wow, but see, you may have difficulty adjusting there. So better to join here under me. And I'll send you to India, but if you have any difficulty, I'll call you back. You'll be my man. Again, he was trying to sell, you know, the center now. So now he's my guru. How can I say no? But I wasn't feeling right about it, but I somehow reluctantly agreed. For a very brief period, I don't even remember how long that period was. It might have been literally one day. But it wasn't sitting well with him. But he was so excited, he sent out the form to Bilumat immediately. He had me fill out the form, send it to Bilumat. I've got a new young Brumachari, just finished his PhD, he's joining here. But anyway. About a day later, I'm sitting in the temple, uh, feeling very uneasy about this. And then I came outside. There are these benches outside of the Hollywood temples. So I'm sitting on one of those benches alone, thinking. And then an elderly gentleman, whom I thought was a devotee, wearing pants and a tucked-in dress shirt and glasses, looked about in his 70s. He looked at me very sweetly. And he said, what's the matter? It seems like there's something on your mind. And I told him. I'm like, why? I said, I was really feeling like I wanted to be a monk in India. Now suddenly he wants me to join here. He's my guru. So then I said, what should I do? Oh, then he said, he said, well, let me tell you my joining story. So that person turned out to be Swami Sarvadevananda. I guess what he told me later is that Swahananji didn't like monks to be wearing Gerua outside of the ashrama. So that's why maybe he went for a doctor's appointment. Who knows? He was wearing pants and shirts. So he was Sarvadevananda, the current head of Hollywood. And after hearing his story and realizing he's a monk, I said, uh, what do you suggest I do? And he gave me one simple piece of advice. He said, you should follow your heart. And that gave me the courage to go back to Swan and Lizzie. And I said, Maharaj, uh, please don't mind, but I had my heart set on joining in India. And then he said, I understand. You want your freedom. He would do this thing with his arms, hands. And then I had also told him that I want to do a six-month pilgrimage in India. And he's so kind and so generous. He didn't hold it against me. He was very supportive. He wrote a letter to all Swamis in India. Please allow Brahmachari Ayan to remain in your ashrama for up to three nights. And I carried that letter with me throughout. And all the different ashramas I visited, even outside the Ramakrishna mission. Like Divine Life Society in Rishikesh, I stayed for three weeks and I just showed that letter and he, he was, he's so highly respected by all the swamis and spiritual organizations that I had no trouble. And uh, and then I decided to join at Vivekananda University. It was called Vivekananda University at the time in Bilima. The brand new university started by the Ramakrishna Order. And I was the first Brahmachari to join there actually. 
And uh, yeah, the rest is history, as Mataji mentioned. But uh, yeah, if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. If you have any questions, raise your hand and we'll bring a mic. Uh, Namaskar, uh, Maharaj. So my question... Tell me your name first. Yeah, my name is Dilip. Dilip. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, now we say Atman and Brahman are one, but uh, we have so many individual souls here. So how do we explain that? So for... For my eyes, they are all different souls right now, called as jivas. Mm -hmm. But uh, I heard some people. I mean, some of the most revered swamis say that Atman and Parabrahman mm -hmm. are one. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I see the contradiction there. So yeah, how would you answer that? Yeah, that's a good question. It's not just revered swamis who say it. The scriptures say it. I am Atma Brahma, right? And there are many other places. The Upanishads say that. The Gita says it. How do we interpret it? It's a good question. Well, it depends. It depends on the school of Vedanta you're talking about because different schools of Vedanta will give different answers to the question. So it's good to have an understanding of the range of philosophies within the tradition of Vedanta. So to give you some sense of it, a very brief summary. Classical Advaita Vedanta, that's the school of Shankara. What's his answer? Absolute identity between the individual soul, and non-dual Brahman, understood as attributeless pure consciousness. So then you ask a very obvious question, what about the fact that I seem to have a separate individuality, he seems to have a different individuality, use it. How, do, how does Advaita Vedanta account for that? He say yes, it's an illusion. It's true from the empirical, Yavaharika standpoint, but from the ultimate standpoint, when you realize your true nature is Brahman, you realize Jagat Mithya. Actually, this entire world of names and forms is illusory. Our apparent individuality, that we're different Jivatmas sitting in this room together, illusory. None of it ever happened. It was never true. What was, what's the analogy that he used to use? The rope and the snake. There's a rope, which I mistakenly see as a snake. When I get closer and I finally see it as a rope, what happens? Does the snake run away? No, I realize there never was a snake. I misperceived the rope as a snake. Likewise, we are, there's nothing but Brahman, non-dual pure consciousness. But out of ignorance of Brahman, we're falsely superimposing all sorts of illusory appearances. Well, like I'm, I'm superimposing microphone that's on the Brahman and it looks like a microphone. Again. I'm superimposing Medanandatva on Brahman and I think that I'm Medananda and so on and so forth. When you realize Brahman, what happens? All those upadis, those li limiting adjuncts, what we superimposed, disappears, vanishes. And what's left? Non-dual Brahman. So that's a very a short summary of the Advaita Vedantic answer to the question, in what sense is each of us Brahman? In the sense of absolute identity. Individuality is an illusion. But other schools give very different answers. Ramanus is Vishtadvaita Vedanta. This is the Bhakti school of Vedanta. Ramanuja, of course, any school of Vedanta has to accept the Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, and Brahma Sutra as authoritative scriptures, no doubt. But these scriptures have been interpreted in totally different ways by these different schools. So Ramanuja says Shankara is wrong. Shankara in his school is wrong in claiming that the best way to interpret I am Atma Brahma, that the, the that Atman is Brahman, is as in the in the sense of absolute identity. This is a mistake, he says. Ramanuja does not even accept Nirguna Brahman from Shankara. He doesn't accept that. He, he accepts Brahman. But what is Brahman for Ramanuja? Vishnu, Narayana. The personal God. You see. And in what sense is each of us that Vishnu? We are Amshas and he is Amshi. He is the whole, we are parts. You see. Madhva, he was the founder of the Dvaita Vedanta school the dualistic school of Vedanta. He also accepts the Upanishads. He also accepts that the Atman is in some sense Brahman. In what sense? He says there's a servant-master relationship between souls and, again, Brahman understood as Vishnu Narayana. So he and Ramanuja both think that Brahman is the personal God. And we are his servants. So what does Sri Ramakrishna say? Now how would a Ramakrishnite, a follower of our tradition, 
Answer the same question that you asked, a very good question. In what sense is Atman Brahman? All of the above. How do we know that? In the gospel, Sri Ramakrishna is fond of quoting Hanuman. Deha buddhya dasos me, jiva buddhya todam shakaha, atma buddhya tone vaham iti me nishitamahi. When I identify with the body, I say, O Rama, this is Hanuman addressing Rama, I say, I am your servant, humble servant. When I identify with the jiva, the individual soul, then I say, I am an amsha, I am a portion of you, and you are the whole. And when I identify with the Paramatman, the Supreme Atman, then I say, I am you, you are me. What a beautiful reconciliation of Dvaita, Vishishta Dvaita and Advaita without getting into the game of higher and lower, of hierarchies. No hierarchy then. In fact, Sri Ramakrishna himself, in one place in the gospel, looks around, sees that everybody is part of this inner circle, his Antaranga. He says, you are all my very own. Let me tell you, I have come to the final realization so, and then he explains this, he quotes Hanuman, <clears throat> based on his own direct spiritual realization. All of these different attitudes are true. Without higher, without saying, like a classical Advaita, that the absolute identity relationship is the highest. You see, he gives another example. He says, I have a flute. I could play one note on a flute constantly. Mm, what is that? Soham. I am Atma Brahma in the sense of Advaita Vedanta. I am identical with non-dual for conscious. He says, but boring. What I want to do is play ragas and raginis on this flute. I want to revel in various attitudes toward God. I want to relate to God. I want to have different kinds of relationships with God. Vatsalya. So I want to think of God sometimes as my mother, sometimes as my father, sometimes as my child, sometimes as my friend, sometimes as my lover. Sometimes I like to think that I'm identical with, and each of these is true. So, short answer to your question. Thank you. What, what you've just described is this beautiful evolution from duet to adwet, which also has been fairly esoteric and, and limited to, you know, the chosen few, for instance, the Nambudri Brahmins in Kerala who, or, you know, Came, came down from the lineage of Shankaracharya until such time the select gurus have taken it to the masses. So for for most of the mainstream folks who are householders, is, is that also the logical path? Embrace Dwayat and then go to Advait for the ultimate state of Satchidananda or maybe Gautam Samadhi? I think you completely misunderstood what I said. Because what I was saying is that it's not uh, an evolution from Dvaita to Vishta, Dvaita to Advaita. Uh, Isn't that the reality for most people? Uh, I don't think so. Because you just said that Advaita is meant for a tiny elite, right? So how could that be the reality for most people? I'm, I'm saying so for people from the mainstream yeah, yeah. to get there, yeah. you have to, have to go from what is ubiquitous no, 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 to the esoteric, I, 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 right? I just didn't understand it. So let me just try to clarify my understanding of our tradition. I don't think our tradition says that Advaita is higher than Bhakti. Mm -hmm. Our tradition, on my interpretation, places Bhakti traditions on an equal footing with the path of Gyan. Okay. So there's no evolution and no hierarchy and no ladder going from Bhakti ultimately to Advaita. What does Sri Ramakrishna say? Bhaktas don't want to become sugar, they want to eat sugar. Let them eat sugar. Why force them to become sugar? You don't want it. What does that mean? It means there are two fundamentally different kinds of liberation, depending on temperament. Okay? One state of liberation is the Advaitic state of liberation, mm -hmm. sometimes called nirvana. Trump will describe it as a salto, going to measure the depth of the ocean. The moment it sets foot in the ocean, what happens? It melts in the ocean. There's just non dual pure consciousness. No heavens, no coming and going. You rest in your true nature as non dual pure consciousness. That's liberation from the standpoint of Advaita Vedanta. Sri Ramakrishna fully accepts it as uh, one form of liberation, but it's not the only form. You know why? Several things. In the Gospel, Mohima Chakraborty, staunch Lord Shankara, asks him, but Bhaktas also need Nirvana eventually, don't they? Mm. He's an Advaita, and so he, he asks the very similar question to yours. Bhaktas ultimately, ultimately they have to give up their bhakti and finally realize their absolute identity with Brahma, right? Wrong. Sharma says no, false. 
says in some bhakti schools, there is Nitya Krishna, Nitya Bhakta, the eternal Krishna with his eternal bhaktas. Chinmoy Shan, Chinmoy Dham. Krishna is consciousness, divine consciousness, and so is his abode, Chinmoy Dham, Chinmoy Dhamma in Bangla. That means his abode, Goloka, that transcendental eternal Loka, itself is the same consciousness. And then he says, imagine an infinite ocean. That infinite ocean is Satchitananda. Mm. In certain places, under the cooling influence of the breeze of bhakti, he was a great poet, so he had this beautiful analogy. Th that ocean forms into different formations of ice. Each of those forms of ice corresponds to what? Different form of the personal God. One can be Vishnu, one can be Krishna, one can be Christ, and so on. Then the analogy continues. With the rising of the sun of knowledge, Gyan Shujo, the ice forms melt. Then the Advaitas will feel vindicated. See, Sri Ramakrishna thinks that Advaita is the highest. Wrong, because the story goes on. Mm. Then he says, but in some places the ice doesn't melt. Mm. It becomes like quartz. It becomes like quartz. And then he says, Nitya Shakar in Bangla. Nitya Sakar. There are eternal forms of God. So, so now let's come back to what is, you might ask, what is the other form of liberation? I thought that liberation means you're one with Brahman. Wrong. There's also eating sugar. Eating sugar is, or bhaktas who want to eat sugar, they reside as liberated jivas in an eternal heaven, in an eternal loka. There are different lokas for different personal gods. There's Ramakrishna loka for us. There's Vishnu loka. The Vaikuntha Loka. There's Bo Loka for Krishna, for worshippers of Krishna. What do they do? They're in bliss. They're in an eternal, blissful, loving communion relationship with Krishna. They serve Krishna, they worship Krishna. You might think that sounds boring, won't you get? That's because we're projecting our own human limitations into this eternal state. We have no idea. We can't possibly fathom the bliss of this. But Sri Krishna fully accepts both ideals. That's the important thing. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. One question online is, do you intend to write commentaries on the Gita Upanishads based on Sri Ramakrishna's integrated Vedanta? I hope so. God willing. So that is in, uh, in, my, in my plans, but uh, man proposes, God disposes. So God willing, Sri Ramakrishna willing, yes, I would like to write commentaries on Bhagavad Gita first, then Upanishads, and then Brahma Sutra. Because I think these commentaries are urgently needed. I didn't come up with the idea. Swami Vivekananda said again and again that we should not rely on traditional commentators in understanding the scriptures. Why? He said Shankaracharya and all the other commentators, even though their commentaries are full of insights, they also at times tortured the scriptures to suit their own philosophies. He used very strong language. In the inspired talks, he uses even stronger language. And he says, they were at times conscious liars because their main aim is to establish their own philosophical school. And by hook or by crook, they had to somehow prove that the Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, and Brahma Sutra support their respective philosophies. So Swamiji says, now is the time to reinterpret the Vedantic scriptures in the light of the life and teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. And yet, after 120 years, nobody has done it. So I feel that's high time. But somebody had a question about this. Pranam Swamiji. Um, my, name, my name is Kalash. So <laughs> I've recently found, found Vedanta. I mean, I've kind of been... Um, sure, yeah. I've been mostly agnostic and at some points even firmly atheistic because I live in the Bible Belt and so God is a very weighted yeah. word in Texas. So let's leave that aside. I guess the real question I have is I've had several decades of practice building up a self-concept and strengthening it and it's not a great self-concept. I mean, ego is always not, well, my ego, I guess, needs work. I guess that's the question is should one work on fixing your ego, making it more 
adaptive instead of the maladaptive behaviors we might have picked up due to whatever mm -hmm. samskaras we had uh, ongoing uh, as as we grew up and all that. Or do we just let just drop it and just just try to find the the authentic self? Yeah, so that's the struggle I have because those maladaptive behaviors obviously are they have several decades of practice and mm -hmm. so they always come to the front and you know impinge on the way you, you well, operate in the world how much effort should one put to try to remediate that and try to be try to fix our ego yeah okay good question i mean uh, there are different ways of answering it one way of answering it from a realistic perspective is to say that there are two ways of dealing with the ego in the spiritual life one is to try to transcend the ego or to eliminate it one way. But Sri Ramakrishna says it's very difficult. And so for most people, it's better to, he says, let the ego stay, but turn it into Bhakterami. So in Bangla, Bhajatami means rascal ego. <laughs> what is the rascal ego? The ego that's attached to lust and greed, to worldly things. He says, convert that I, that rascal ego, into the Bhakterami, the child of God, servant of God. So you don't have to eliminate ego. You can just spiritualize it. That's the beauty of it. That's one way of answering it. Now, there's another way of approaching your question. Because you're using the language of maladaptation. This is a kind of psychological, psychotherapeutic language. And so it struck me that um, I really like this concept developed by this American Buddhist psychotherapist um, called spiritual bypassing. Uh, do people know, are you, are you familiar with this concept of spiritual bypassing? It's a very powerful concept. The idea is, I've got all sorts of problems in my life. My, my wife just dumped me. Uh, I just lost my job. Uh, I have an alcohol problem. Whatever it might be. You don't quote me on these things. I'm not the one who had these problems. Anyway, <laughs> control it. Whatever. So what do I do? I go to the temple. Instead of confronting my issues, my problems, my alcohol addiction, and this is that, I run off to the temple. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't come to the temple if you have these problems. But it's all about your motivation. Are you unconsciously running away from your problems and retreating into spirituality, escaping into spirituality? Then that's spiritual bypassing. What is spiritual bypassing? You bypass your day-to-day -day life problems, issues, difficulties, challenges, by fleeing into, escaping into spiritual life. That's not healthy. Genuine spiritual life involves being brutally honest with yourself about your limitations, your weaknesses, your strengths too, and not running away from your problems, but acknowledging them, and then trying to find a spiritual solution to them. Then that's not spiritual bypassing. So I, I don't know if that's relevant to what you were asking, but I think there are two different ways of answering that question. Thank you. Oh, my name is Don. Um, I've read the Upanishads and uh, the Gita, and I'm currently reading uh, the Gospel of Ramakrishna halfway through. So I decided to pick up the Brahma Sutras, mm. and I immediately put it down. <laughs> I was about to say good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I couldn't find anything online or mm. other monks that speak or give teachings about the Brahma Sutra? Why is it such a hard book mm -hmm. to teach from? Okay, good question. Why is the Brahma Sutra such a hard book to teach from or even to study, to learn from? Well, it's because it's in the form of sutras. There's a whole form of literature in India called the sutras. Yoga sutras are also written in sutras, but mercifully, most of those sutras are relatively self-contained. They're mostly grammatically complete sentences. They're not all that cryptic. Some of them are, but most of them are not. You can pretty much understand the meaning of the sutras without elaborate commentaries. The commentaries help, but a lot of these sutras and the yoga sutras are standalone. That is not the case with the Brahma sutras. The Brahma sutras, the sutras in those Brahma sutras are extraordinarily compressed laconic, downright cryptic. They're, they're sutras that are literally, one of them is cha. Cha means and in Sanskrit. And, now interpret that. How do you get Vedanta from and? Good luck. 
And so there have been voluminous commentaries written on the Brahma Sutras. And I've written an article on, the, on, on interpreting the Brahma Sutras from the standpoint of Swami Vivekananda, our tradition. If you're interested, you can look at it. Um, it has a long academic title, Asmin Nasya Chata Dyogam Shasti. It's, it's 1.19. Uh, 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 it's basically a focusing on 1.1.19 of the Brahma Sutra in the light of Swami Vivekananda. Um, so what you find is, actually there's a really interesting encounter between Swami Vivekananda and one of his disciples named Shuddhananda. Shuddhananda was a scholarly monk and he's carrying a book with him. And Swami Vivekananda asks, what, what book are you reading? And he says, oh, I'm reading Shankara's commentary on the Brahma Sutra. Expecting that Swami Vivekananda will be very pleased. He loses patience with him. He says, I never told you to read Shankara's commentary. He said, I want you to try to understand the original meaning of the sutras themselves. What was the original intention of Vyasa? Vyasa is, now we say Bhagavarayana is the author of Brahma Sutras. At the time, many people thought it was Vyasa. But in any case, I want you to try to understand the original meaning of the sutras independently of the commentaries. And then Swamiji himself gives a nice example. He quotes 1.1.19 of the Brahma Sutra. Asmin nasya cha tad yogam shasti. What, what the sutra literally means is the scriptures, meaning the Upanishads, teach the, it comes back to your question, the yoga, the union between Jivatma and Brahman. That's what the sutra teaches. How do you interpret that union, that yoga between Jiva and Brahman? There are many different ways. Of so Swamiji, what does he say? He says, he says, yes, you can interpret this from Shankara's standpoint and understand it as absolute identity. And he says, but you can equally interpret it as part and whole. So he accepts Ramanuja's interpretation as well. And I use that as a kind of pregnant hint to develop a Vivekanandan slash Ramakrishnan interpretation of the Brahma Sutra. You might find it interesting. If you type in my name in Google, you'll find I have an academic website called academia.edu. And there I have all my articles. And you can find that one in the Brahma Sutra. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, look, I mean, reading Brahma Sutra is not mandatory. Um, I think it's better to stick with Gita, really, primarily. Um, and you can read multiple commentaries on the Gita. So if you just stick to one, there's a great danger in being biased by that one perspective. So what I like to do is triangulate with multiple commentaries. So I'm teaching a class now called Bhagavad Gita and the Light of Sri Ramakrishna. Um, and the main textbook is Sri Aurobindo's Essays on the Gita. Because he was profoundly influenced by Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. And so I think he's done a better job than any of our monks in interpreting the Gita in the light of Sri Ramakrishna without naming Sri Ramakrishna. And his English is so difficult that most people have difficulty reading, like understanding what he's saying. But if you can get past that difficulty, it's a very, very profound text, insightful text from the standpoint of our tradition. But I also bring in Shankara's commentaries, Ramanuja's commentary, Tapasthanandi's commentary. Uh, Maharaj, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you so much for creating or uh, writing about the framework of Vigyana uh, 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 Vedanta. Vedanta so that we can understand Sri Ramakrishna's teaching. And um, I, I'll need about a minute to develop the question, if you don't mind. Uh, so, I found a precept of Sri Ramakrishna in this book, uh, Words of the Master, which mm -hmm. I couldn't find an explanation for, and I'll just read out the precept for everybody. So why is the necessity, so Sri Ramakrishna is telling Totapuri mm -hmm. that why is the necessity of daily meditation mm -hmm. in your uh, present advanced state? Mm -hmm. To which Totapuri replies yeah. that uh, we need, just just like a brass vessel would lose its luster if you don't meditate every day. And to that Sri Ramakrishna quipped that it doesn't matter if you're a gold vessel. Yeah. And I couldn't understand the meaning of that, mm -hmm. um, the underlying, uh, you know, the context, and I couldn't find anywhere. So then I started thinking about the Vigyana Vedanta framework mm -hmm. that we provided. And I think I found a link I would like to know your opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first thing that uh, Thakur says many times while talking about Vigyana Vedanta is that this quote, uh, he who is aware of knowledge is also aware of ignorance. Uh, for example, he tells M on September 9th, 1883, and he then instructs that to attend Vigyana, one must uh, throw the thorn of knowledge uh, to remove the thorn of ignorance, uh, use the 
use yeah. a uh, thorn of knowledge to uh, remove the ignorance and then discard the thorn of knowledge itself. It's both, yeah. both, yeah. So, and then I think that is kind of linked to the second step, which is um, Thakur uh, intimating that there's a difference in the nature, and this is my understanding, you can correct me if I'm wrong, of the I consciousness or the ego between the Jnani and the Vijnani in the relative plane, because Thakur says that uh, the eight fetters fall away for the Vijnani, um, and then he suggests that the ego of the Vijnani is a mere appearance. He doesn't say that for the Jnani. So, and I think we have some examples because we see that um, uh, uh, Totapri himself getting angry at the watchman for lighting the smoke. Uh, and then also Vishishta, who is a Brahmagani. Uh, Vashishta, yeah, sorry. Vashishta is a Brahmagani uh, having sorrow over the death of his sons. Right, and I think that for the Vigyani, it is not the case because Vigyani is thrown away both the knowledge and the ignorance, um, and so so Vigyani has uh, basically uh, devoid of. Uh, so uh, just to say that, uh, so Vigyani being beyond both knowledge and ignorance is indifferent to the world and beyond, and so he's always in peace. And the Vigyani sees the world as a model of Okay. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So. Okay. So what do you think about this link? I mean, this is a correct way of interpreting the precept out here, the, the, at least the incident that happened between Totapuri and Thakur when Thakur mentioned that if you're a gold vessel, you don't need to meditate every day. Kind of That's Steering incidents in the life of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, how do you interpret it? There are many different ways, and I can just make give my own suggestion. Um, see, look at the overall narrative of Sri Ramakrishna's encounter with Totapuri, okay? Totapuri apparently had already attained Brahmagyana before meeting Sri Ramakrishna. He had attained the state of Nirvika of Samadhi, and he comes to Sri Ramakrishna as a Jivan Mukta. This is just part of, if you look at Shalananji's biography, you'll see that. No doubts about it. And he teaches Sri Ramakrishna Advaita, Vedanta. Sri Ramakrishna has no difficulty removing his mind from worldly things, but what happens? He gets stuck at Kali, mother, his beloved mother Kali. So what does Totapuri do? He takes a shard of glass, and he pierces him slightly here, and Sri Ramakrishna imagines or sees Kali being cut in half by the sword of knowledge, Gyanaroshi, and soars in the state of Yoga Samadhi in a very, very brief period of time. Totapuri is completely stunned. And then now, and there are other incidents that happen, which are quite interesting. Totapuri, even though he's a wandering monk who would never stay in one place for more than a couple of days, he stays for a long time because he's completely mesmerized by Sri Ramakrishna. But Totapuri is a jnani. And remember, Sri Ramakrishna is even beyond that. So what happened, I, the way I see this is, Totapuri was his Advaita guru, Sri Ramakrishna's guru. After Sri Ramakrishna attains Nirvigabha Samadhi, he turns around and becomes Totapuri's guru. And he says, now let me do you a favor. You're a jnani, let me make you into a big jnani. How do we know this? Because Totapuri one day is suffering from terrible dysentery, I think, and other issues with his body. And he says, I've already realized, Brahma, I know this is all an illusion. Let me just get rid of the body. Good riddance. Run, goes off to this river to kill himself. Finds out, he can't, no matter how far he goes, he can't find enough water to, to drown him. And then he has this kind of mystical realization, seems like that this is all Divine Mother's play. So I see this incident as Sri Ramakrishna playing with Totapuri and teaching him to accept the reality of Shakti. Before that, he would taunt him. When Sri Ramakrishna would clap his hands, he would say, what are you making, chapatis? Sri Ramakrishna made him accept Shakti and turned him into a Vigyani. So in that context, I think this might be another way of Sri Ramakrishna encouraging him to move beyond, ascend from the standpoint of Jnana. Why is the Gyan, see, another place, he says the Gyani is full of fear. He says this in the gospel. Why? Because Brahma Satyam Jagad Mithya. The world is unreal. Imagine this. There are three different paradigms, right? One is, I'm dreaming, and I don't know I'm dreaming. Right? Ordinary people dream like that. Second scenario, I'm in a dream, I'm dreaming, but I'm lucidly dreaming. That means I'm, I know I'm in the dream. Right? It could be a nightmare. And unless I know special lucid dreaming techniques, there's no easy way for me to get out of the dream. I have to wait it out. 
So imagine that's a terrible dream. It's a nightmare. Even though I'm lucid, I'm still terrified and I'm still very, very unhappy. And then there's a third scenario. I'm dreaming and then I wake up from the dream. The goal for Advaita Vedanta is waking up from the dream. What was Totapuri's state at the time? He was a lucid dreamer. Of the three scenarios, he, he didn't wake up. He was still stuck in this darn body. He's still seeing this illusory world. That's the fear. That's why he's still concerned about keeping the mind pure. Why? So that the mind is a good reflector, a clean reflector of Brahman. So that he can enjoy the bliss of Brahman while he's still in this illusory body, in this illusory world. Sri Ramakrishna says, I want to dance with both hands up. And he gives a beautiful story about two weaver women. This is in the gospel as well. One weaver woman goes to the other weaver woman's house. And this weaver woman sees that this her friend has a beautiful ball of yarn, much nicer than her own ball. And so she comes up with an idea. She wants to steal this ball of yarn. So when her friend's not looking, she her own like this. And then this other, the, the weaver woman is smart. She wrecked, she noticed that she put the, was hiding under her own. So she comes up with a nice idea. She says, come my friend, let's dance together. <laughs> So they start dancing. And imagine how this person's dancing. <laughs> so Sri Ramakrishna says, why should he dance with one more like this? I'll dance with both hands up. That's the big jnani. The jnani is in fear because he's confronting with his failure at every step. The failure is, I'm still seeing this darn world. I thought I transcended the world, but I'm still seeing the world. Until my prana, the karma rubs out, it runs out and I can finally... Get rid of this God for second body. Trump just says, Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam. Turianji's last words. Brahma Shutta Jagat Shutta Shavi Shutta Shutte Pran Tushita. Brahman is real. Jagat Satyam, the Jagat, this world also is real. Everything is real. Shavi Shutta. Shutte Pran Tushita. Life itself is grounded in the truth. That's your Ambrose's Vikyan. You have nothing to fear. Whether you're in this world, whether you're in the body, whether you're out of the body, everything is God. Everything is divine consciousness. Pranam Swamiji, my name is Vibha. Yes. Vibha. Vibha. Yes. Um, so uh, Thakur says that there are two kinds of reasoning. Two kinds of? Reasoning. reasoning. Yes. Involution and evolution. Uh, that is um, anulom and bilom. Like the bark of a tree goes with a pit and pit goes with a bark. Can you please elaborate how these two kinds of thinking relates to the paths of negation and affirmation and also to the relationship between Nikya and Leela? Right. Yeah. So again, it's there's a place where M has to be. Is the world unreal? And Sri Ramakrishna's answer is, why should the world be unreal? On alone below, involution and evolution. And he gives the example of a bale fruit. And he says, if you just take the weight of the pulp of the bale, the weight of the bale fruit falls short. You have to take the weight of the whole bale fruit, including the seeds in the shell, to get the whole weight. And he says, likewise, you shouldn't just say that non-dual Brahman alone is true and that this world of names and forms, the personal God, individual souls are all unreal. Because then the way of the bale fruit falls short. You have to accept everything as aspects of that same infinite divine reality. So what is Anulom Bilom, this involution evolution? The idea is, as far as I understand it, there's this cyclical view of creation in Hinduism. Okay, right now this universe, this jagat, is in its manifest state. Eventually, there's going to be a big crunch. That's what physicists call it. What happens? This entire manifest universe will contract into a seed state, bija avastha. But it's still there. The entire universe is involved. So, using this technical language, involution, in the sense of involution, involved in that seed. In the next cycle of creation, what happens? That seed evolves into the manifest universe as we see it now. You see, 
Now, why is that relevant to Vigyan and all these things? Munda Kupanishad has a beautiful metaphor to explain the relationship between Brahman and this world of names and forms. He uses the metaphor of a spider. And now, whether it's biologically true of uh, insects like spiders is beside the point. It's a metaphor. So let's not freak out about that. Okay, but the spider metaphor in the Mundaka Upanishad is as follows. The spider will project it, a web out of itself, out of its own body. And what is that cobweb made of? Itself. And eventually it'll contract that cobweb back into its body. Just so Brahman projects a universe out of itself. It's not something, the universe is not something different from Brahman. In technical language, it is the Upadhanakara. Brahman is the Upadhanakara, the material cause of this universe. The universe is God. It's, it's the material of the universe is God. And then eventually God will. So that's evolution. The state of evolution is when the, when the spider throws out the cover. And involution is when it pulls that withdraws the cover back into it. But the idea is the universe is always nothing but God, either in the state of involution or in the state of evolution. There's just a spider. The spider with the cobweb inside, God. Spider with the cobweb outside, equally God. So the world is real. This is why he brings it in in the context of M's question. M asks the point blank question, is the world unreal? Point blank answer, no. The world is God. He says, the Vigyani sees that Brahman itself has become the 24 cosmic principles. So how can the world be unreal? So then you ask about Nitya Mila. That's another, he uses this expression also in the context of Vigyana. Because what he says is, when you attain Brahma Jnana, knowledge of Brahma, you have realized the Nitya. That's what he calls the Nitya. Okay? Non-dual Brahman. Then he says, but that Brahman is one with Shakti. Brahma or Shakti Abed. One of his main teachings. Also from the standpoint of Vigyan that he says this. Brahman and Shakti are inseparable. Brahman is the non-dual, impersonal Brahman of Advaita Vedanta. Shakti is the personal God. And then he says further, the Vigyani sees that it is Shakti that has become everything in this world. You see. And then he says, the Vigyani, therefore the Vigyani will happily and blissfully, he doesn't just stay stuck at the Nitya level, he can happily go from the Nitya to the Lila. What is the Lila? The divine play. This world, this entire world is nothing but the play of Shakti. Mother's play. And fearlessly enjoy this play without feeling like it's some kind of fall from the heights of Nirvigabha Samadhi. No. This is equally God. Shramana says, why should I only see God with my eyes closed? Why can't I see God with my eyes open? That's the big yani, the fearless big yani. Does that make sense? Thank you. We've got an online question from Gopal Rao. What is self-realization for Vedanta and Ramakrishna? Okay. As if Ramakrishna is different from Vedanta. So, the, so what is self-realization according to Vedanta and according to Ramakrishna? The thing is, there are different schools of Vedanta, as I already mentioned in the context of another gentleman's question. Um, and so different schools of Vedanta will give different answers to the question. What is self-realization according to Ramanuja's school? You know, one thing that made people, they, if you study anything, you study Shankara, unfortunately, and you don't study anything else most of the time. So people, they've only heard vaguely of Ramanuja, but they don't study him. But it's well worth studying. So one book I'd strongly recommend is Swami Tapasana's book called Bhakti Schools of Vedanta. And he says it in the introduction. He says, people are so obsessed with Shankara, they don't read anything else. And they mistakenly conflate Vedanta with Advaita Vedanta. When in fact, the tradition of Vedanta is much vaster than just one, one sub-school. So, Ramanuja. Many of you probably don't know that Ramanuja gave a prominent position to Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge. How many of you know that? Very few. But what is the path of knowledge according to Ramanuja? What he says is this. He says, Jnana Yoga is the practice of meditating on your true nature as an eternal individual soul, a jivatman, separate from the body-mind complex. And 
through that practice, what happens? You eventually attain the spiritual realization of yourself as the Jivatman, a spiritual entity separate from the body mind complex. He called that in Sanskrit Atma Avalokanam. Atma Avalokanam. That's self realization for Ramanuja. But that's not the highest goal, according to Ramanuja. That's preliminary to. So, this is a very profound spiritual insight, actually. He says, you cannot feel true bhakti for God until you have realized your true nature as an individual soul, as a spiritual entity separate from the body-mind complex. So long as we mistakenly identify with the body-mind complex, we can never feel true love for God. So Ramanuja says, jnana yoga is a preparatory discipline before you can practice bhakti yoga in earnest. And he says the ultimate goal, so first you need self-realization in the form of realizing your true nature as an eternal individual soul. Then you practice bhakti because you're finally qualified to practice bhakti. What is bhakti yoga according to Ramanuja? Constant contemplation of God. Constant. And the emphasis here is on constant. Many of us can think of God for a couple seconds and then we start thinking about what we're going to eat for our next meal and this and that. Constant recollection of God requires that you realize your true nature as an eternal soul. Because the soul is already a great bhakta. The soul already loves God. But we don't know it because we identify with the body mind complex. You see. So the ultimate goal is, so self-realization is a stepping stone toward God-realization according to Ramanujan. Now let's look at classical Advaitavedam. What does that say about self-realization? First of all, the nature of a self is totally different in classical Advaita than it is in Ramanujan. Because classical Advaita does not accept the ultimate reality of individual souls. It says Jivatma itself is an illusion. So self-realization according to classical Advaita is realization of the non-dual self. Your self is identical with my self, is identical with your self, there's only one non-dual self. And that's the ultimate goal, according to Thais Kaudhavadvidam. There's no higher God realization. In fact, it's a God realization in the sense of the realization of the personal God, like Vishnu, is a lower realization. Because it's only true from the empirical standpoint. It's not true from the ultimate standpoint. From the ultimate standpoint, the only truth is the non-dual self. Non-dual pure consciousness. That alone exists. Everything else is an illusion. So that in a, that's, I'm just giving you two contrasting um, explanations of what self-realization means in two different schools of Vedanta. And now he, the person also asks about Sri Ramakrishna. As I said also in relation to your question, Sri Ramakrishna beautifully harmonizes both of these forms of self-realization. Sri Ramakrishna will fully accept Ramanuja's standpoint and say that yes, you do need to realize yourself as a Jivatman in order to feel true bhakti. You know where he says this? It's very interesting. He's in the gospel. He brings in the Shat Chakra, the six chakras. And he says that the first meaningful spiritual realization that a spiritual aspirant has is when the one ascends to the heart level, the heart chakra. And he says, then you realize yourself as a jivatma. In Bangla, so the English is, this spiritual aspirant, when he reaches the heart center, realizes that he is the jivatman, the eternal soul separate from the body-mind complex. And he says, what is this? What is this? It's this extraordinary spiritual realization. And he says, you realize yourself as a Jeevatman in the form of a shikha, a, a, a flame. So that's the fourth, the fourth, right? And then finally you go up to the fifth and then the sixth and then God, the realization of the personal God is the sixth between the eyebrows. And then Nirgava Samadhi is Sahasrara Chakra. So I think he would agree with Ramanujya about that. At the same time, he would agree with Ramanujan that, that yes, for bhaktas, the highest goal is eating sugar, realizing the personal God. Happy with that. Ramanujan will equally accept the Advaitic ideal, the classical Advaitic ideal. Yes, you guys want to become sugar? That's the ideal for you. Self-realization for you is realizing it's like a salt bell melting in the ocean. You lose your individuality in non-dual pure consciousness. That's the highest goal for you. That, he also fully accepts that. So Sri Ramakrishna, from the standpoint of Vigyana Vedanta, not from the standpoint of classical Advaita, you can understand Sri Ramakrishna as harmonizing all of these different understandings of self-realization, God-realization, liberation, different yogas. He doesn't put any of the yoga. He doesn't put Bhakti Yoga on a higher footing than Jnana Yoga as Ramanuja and Madhva does. He doesn't put Jnana Yoga on a higher footing than Bhakti Yoga as Shankara does. Equal footing. As Swami Vivekananda used to say, each of the four yogas is fitted to make man perfect without the help of the others. Each is a direct and independent path to moksha, directly contradicts Shankara, which says that only one path, one yoga, leads directly to moksha, which is Jnana Yoga. 
I have a question. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, a statement. I'd like you to comment on it. When I was a young nun, and this question of jnana and vigyana uh, came up mm -hmm. in our study with Swami Swahananda, mm -hmm. I asked him privately, what would you say is the greatest? Mm -hmm. And Swami Swahananda was a disciple of Swami Vigyananda. He was also a scholar. He said, oneness, of course. What? what? Oneness, of course, oneness. is the highest. But Vigyana is the greater achievement. Hmm. Now, are there only certain types of individuals that would have that capacity for the Vigyana experience? Now, we know in Todapuri's life, he was probably bestowed that by Sri Ramakrishna, yes. by his contact. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on that? Yeah, thank you. But before I comment on that, I'd like to Google with my group. If I dare. Because Swahananda makes it seem as if jnana, she's clearly implying that jnana is a state of oneness and vigyana is not. I think that's false. I think both are states of oneness. That's one of the main things I'm trying to argue in my scholarly work. And I think it's very clear if you study Sri Ramakrishna's teachings on jnana and vigyana that both are unbiotic states, but different kinds of oneness. Jnana is a oneness, you can call it a kind of uh, uh, exclusive oneness. It's the oneness of non-dual pure consciousness at the to the exclusion of everything else. Jivas are, are unreal. The world of names and forms is unreal. The personal God is unreal. And the vigyana is an all-inclusive oneness. That's why my next book, as part of my... So the two books that I'll be signing today are the first two books in what I call my Integral Advaita Trilogy. I'm arguing that three major figures in, in modern Hinduism, Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda, and the third, you may not be able to guess, Sri Aurobindo, have developed a new school of Integral Advaita within Vedantic thought. Okay. Uh, and the book's title is An All in... Oh, so I've written the first two books. I've signed a contract with Oxford for the third book on Sri Aurobindo, but I told them I won't submit the manuscript until uh, end of 2027, so that gives me plenty of time, I hope. But I've set the title already. You have to set the title for the contract. An all-embracing oneness. Sri Aurobindo's Integral Advaita and the Legacy of Sri Ramakrishna. An all-embracing oneness or an all-encompassing oneness. That's the idea. That's the Vigyana oneness. Both are oneness, but one is exclusive, the other is inclusive, all-inclusive. Now, that's the quibble with my guru. Now I come to the main question. Shrampas used to say in the gospel, who is capable of attaining Vigyana? Typically only Ishwara Kotis. He used to distinguish two classes of Jiva. Jiva Koti, by which he means ordinary Jivas, most of us, presumably, and Ishwara Kotis. How did he define Ishwara Koti? Avatar ba avatar and Omsho. He gives a very precise definition. What's an Ishwara Koti? Incarnations of God and those born or who have come as portions of an incarnation. Avatara Amsha, Amsha, avatar, the Amsha of an avatara or an avatara itself, himself or herself. You see. So now that's a very high level thing. He only named five, five, I think plus two, right? Bhavanath and Purna and then five uh, future six, monastic disciples. Six, six, six total. Is that is? Six ish okay, In any case, six, yeah. Four who, uh, of whom became monks later, and then two, because there are two household disciples, Bhavanath and Purno also. So I think it's six plus two, maybe eight. Mm. I think that might be more accurate. Yeah, six plus two. In any case, out of all the great spiritual souls, he only named those, you know. So being an Ishwara Koti is very rare. But, okay, and it seems like he says in many places that only Ishwara Kotis are capable of attaining the state of Vigyana. At the same time, there are complexities and complications here, nuances. One is Mahapurush Maharaj, Shivananda Maharaj. He was not given the stamp of the Ishwara Koti by Sri Ramakrishna. He mentions that in a letter in Bengali. He says, Amaketo Ishwara Koti Chaprash Daini. He didn't give me that stamp. But by his grace, I have been elevated to the status of an Ishwara Koti. Like you, we also just talked about how Sri Ramakrishna elevated Totapur. Totapur was not actually an Ishwara Koti. He made him into Vigyani, right? So these categories are not as rigid as you might think. There's a certain fluidity. The border becomes a little bit more permeable than you might think. And I believe as a devotee, now I'm setting aside my scholar's cap and putting on my monastic slash devotional cap. I believe that with the advent of the Ramakrishna incarnation, Sri Ramakrishna has made accessible, democratized, universalized, this state of Vigyana, which was hitherto 
an extraordinarily rarefied state meant only for a chosen few. He has, by his grace, Vigyana is now made attainable, accessible to every one of us, every single one of us. And you'll find that when you read Swami Vivekananda's work. He teaches Advaita Vedanta, no doubt. But what kind of Advaita Vedanta? That's the question. So in my book on Vivekananda, I ask this, and chapter two especially focuses on this. When he teaches Advaita Vedanta, it's an all-encompassing oneness. More like Sri Ramakrishna's Vikyana Vedanta. He teaches again and again, God in everything. See God everywhere. See God in everything. And he doesn't say, this is for a chosen few. Every single person can become a Vikyana, according to Swami Vivekananda and according to Sri Aurobindo. So I think that it's with the advent of the Ramakrishna incarnation that Vikyana has become democratized. And in a sense, every one of us can become a Vikyana. This one, this uh, incident happened in around 1910, uh, 12 in uh, Banaras. So there was a class uh, that was held on Karma Yoga and uh, Baburam Maharaj uh, attended that class and he immediately remarked that uh, this Karma Yoga of Swamiji is actually Gyana Yoga. Ah. And uh, Swami Prabhavananda was there. Prabhavananda. Prabhavananda from uh, our Southern California Center. And he kind of, uh, he made that mention in that. So, Baburam Maharaj from the epitome of love and as a bhakta, also a Brahma Gyani, from that perspective, merging Karma Yoga into Gyana Yoga, how do we approach that? Because it's, how do it's we... It's difficult to say. The thing is, as I have already discussed, Gyana Yoga itself means different things in different contexts. Gyana Yoga means one thing in the hands of Ramanuja. It means right. a totally different thing in the hand of class, uh, classical advaitans like Shankara. Now, what did he mean by Gyana Yoga? I think it's up in the air. Mm -hmm. I think that what he means is that Swami Vivekananda is describing the practice of Karma Yoga in such high spiritual terms mm -hmm. that it's not really possible to practice that Karma Yoga properly without already having realized God. I take it in that sense. Okay. You have to be a Gyani in that sense. You have to know God. Yeah. Now, that could be non-dual Brahman or it could be the personal God. But you have to be a realized soul in order to really practice Dharma Yoga properly. That's how I see Brahmanandji's okay. comment. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. There's one question online again. Um, okay. Uh, does Parinamavada of Kashmir Vaishnavism similar to Integral Vedanta? Okay, interesting question, but wrong premise. Kashmir Shaivism is a Tantra tradition, very sophisticated philosophical tradition, uh, which does not subscribe to Parinama Bhaga. So that's the mistake in the question. It's not a whopping mistake. It's not a howling mistake. He's on the right track, he or she. Uh, because Kashmir Shaivism upholds the view of Abhasa Vada, that this world is an Abhasa of Shiva. <clears throat> It's an appearance of Shiva, but not an illusory appearance. It's a real manifestation of Shiva. So it's neither quite Parinamavada of, the, of some of the Bhakti schools of Vedanta, like Ramanuja school, nor is it, it's definitely not the Vivartavada of classical Advaita Vedanta. I'm using all these Sanskrit terms, let me explain them. The question is talking about Parinamavada. <clears throat> that is, Vada means doctrine, Parinama means transformation. So this is the view that so the question is, what is the relationship between Brahman on the one hand, ultimate reality, and this world on the other? Parinamavada's answer is, some aspect of Brahman actually transforms into the world. Ramanuja holds this. The cobweb uh, metaphor in the Munda Kapanishad seems to support this kind of view. Also, Chandra Upanishad uses two beautiful metaphors, more than two metaphors, but two of the most memorable ones are what? Gold being, molten gold being fashioned into different gold earrings, golden bracelets, and clay, formless clay, being shaped into differently shaped clay pots, right? These analogies lend themselves perfectly to a Parinamavada kind of interpretation. And I personally think that Sri Ramakrishna, if you tried to categorize him as either a Parinamavadan or a Vivartavadan or a Abhazavadan, I think he comes closest to Parinamavada. Why do I think that? Because if you study the original teachings in Bangla, the gospel, he just says it. He uses the language of transformation. He says, the Vigyani sees, Brahma Chotubhinshi talk to Hoyichin. Hoyichin. 
Brahman has become the 24 cosmic principles. This is, I think, a very direct and literal translation of what he's saying. How do you understand that? How can you possibly say that? That means that the 24 cosmic principles are an illusory appearance of Brahman. No. Brahman has actually become everything in this world. That's Parinamabhada, I think. Now, that's Parinamabhada. Vivartavada is the doctrine held by classical Advaita Vedanta, like Shankara. What's that view? Vivartha means illusory appearance. This world is an illusory appearance of Brahman, just as the snake, which is actually is, a, is an illusory appearance of what's actually a rope. Like that. That's Vivartavada. So what's their answer to the question? What is the relationship between Brahman and this world? Shankara was like, there is no relationship. It's an illusion that there is a relationship. In fact, this world never was. No world, no problem. It's just Brahman. Okay. But the Kashmiri Shaivite position on the relationship between Shiva, the ultimate reality, Shiva Shakti really, and this world is different from both of these positions. First of all, keep in mind that Kashmiri Shaivism is not Vedanta. It's not a Vedantic school. It's separate. It's Tantra. You see, which doesn't mean that it's totally different from Vedanta, but it means that there are going to be nuances, philosophical nuances in Kashmiri Shaivism that you don't find in Vedanta. So the nuance here is, it subscribes to a third doctrine which is called Abhasa Bhama. Abhasa here means real manifestation. Of course, this is also very controversial and different scholars of Kashmir Shaivism and different understandings of Abhasa Bhama that gets very complicated. I'm giving you a nutshell kind of a thing. I think a plausible interpretation is that this entire world is a playful, a real playful manifestation of Shiva. This is the Kashmir Shaiva view. Now, the questioner asks, how do I, uh, well, what's the relationship between the Kashmiri Shaivite understanding of the world and Sri Ramakrishna's? Something that Savarpyanji is fond of uh, quoting. Uh, we have a mutual friend, Savarpyanji and I, Aurindam Chakraborty. He's a very prominent scholar of Indian philosophy, and he's an expert in Nyaya and Advaita Vedanta and, uh, to, to a certain extent, Kashmiri Shaivism. And he, he used to tell me, he also told Sabrakmanji, Arunam Chakraborty, he said, if you want to understand the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna in the gospel, better to study Kashmir Shaivism than to study Shankar Zadrathimana. So Sabrakmanji often mentions this in his lectures, um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. If you want to pigeonhole him, if you, I mean, but I think the best thing is not to pigeonhole Sri Ramakrishna. But if you need to place him in a camp, okay, he comes closer to Kashmir Shaivism than to classical Advaita. you see. But the beauty of Vikyana Vedanta is it's the refusal to pigeonhole. Resist the impulse to pigeonhole Sri Ramakrishna. Resist the impulse to stick him into some kind of sectarian framework. Because even Kashmir Shaivism is sectarian at the end of the day. But does it come close to Trump's teachings than classical Advaita? Yes, I think to a certain extent. Why? I'll give you examples. One of the keynote teachings of Sri Ramakrishna is Brahma or Shakti Abed. Non-dual Brahman is inseparable from Shakti, the personal God. Would Shankara agree with this teaching? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, just study his commentary on the Brahma Sutra and you'll see. He says, all of the attributes of Ishvara, omniscience, omnipotence, these are all illusory limiting adjuncts, upadis, superimposed on non-dual Brahman. When we attain knowledge of Brahman, Ishvara vanishes. It turns out to be uh, an illusory appearance, just as much as these chairs and us as individual souls. You see, so Shankara will not accept that. Uh, where was I going? Sorry, remind me of it. Um, in the Parinamabad of Kashmiri Shaivism. Oh, yeah. Integral to Vedanta. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, Sri Ramakrishna's view. Now, I, oh, yes, Brahma should be up. That was the thing that, yeah, yeah. So, Brahma and Shakti are inseparable. It comes much closer to the Kashmiri Shaivite teaching on ultimate reality. Because what is the Kashmiri Shaivite teaching? The ultimate reality is Prakasha Vimashamaya. Which means, almost literally, it's just a more technical way of saying Brahman and Shakti are inseparable. And a simpler way that the Kashmir Shaivas put is Shiva and Shakti are Abhidha. Shiva and Shakti are one. So it's, it's very difficult to explain Sri Ramakrishna's teaching of the inseparability of Brahman and Shakti from the standpoint of Shankara's classical Advaita, but much easier from the standpoint of Kashmir Shaivism. Second question, what about the nature of this world? Sri Ramakrishna again and again says the world is not unreal. It's a real manifestation of Shakti, of Brahman. Which school does that come closer to? Classical Advaita? No. Why? Because classical Advaita says Brahma Satyam Jagamitya. This world is an illusory appearance of Brahman. 
It actually never existed. The, 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 the Sanskrit term for this is ajata, non-origination. This world never was. It's not that it once existed and that it's that we saw it for a certain amount of time and then it disappeared. We never were. All of this never happened. That's the other idea. It's very radical. Whereas Sri Ramakrishna says this world is a real manifestation of God. Everything in this world. He's, he had that direct spiritual realization. He's doing puja one day in the Kali temple. What does he see suddenly? The puja vessels, Brahma, or divine mother, divine consciousness. Chinmoy, he used the word Chinmoy. The door sill, Chinmoy. Cat walks into the room, Chinmoy. Everything is divine mother. You see, the world and the real manifestation of God, that comes much closer to the Kashmiri Shaivite Abhasavada than to the classical Advaitic Yuvantavada. Thank you, Swami.